Mo friends, Styrofoam is the best model kit ever made because you can create anything from it. Tonight it's not gonna be anything, but it's gonna be a huge two-story French house. Okay, I can't stress enough how important it is to have a plan, or at the very least a sketch of the building before we even start cutting the foam. A 3D mockup is also essential because it helps us with its placement in the diorama and overall dimensions of the house. In this case, I took inspiration from a historical photo, but added a few details and textures to make it more interesting. Measure twice, cut once applies perfectly to this process. Although XPS foam is fairly cheap, wasting a huge plug due to poor measuring always hurts a little. In this case, I had to cut three blocks because my Proxon foam cutter isn't tall enough for a two-story building. The height of one story in 135th scale should be roughly 7 centimeters, give or take. Now that I have three identical blocks, I can start cutting more specific shapes. Millimeter paper is very handy for sketching and measuring because you can quickly reference it without a ruler. Angled cuts can be made in a few different ways on this machine, but the method I like the most is sliding the hot wire sideways until it matches the angle I measured on the foam block. This way I can cut both identical sides of the roof without too much hassle. Ok, we're almost there, but now we have to make the most difficult cut. The back side of the house must sit perfectly flush with the sides of the diorama, and this is where a single wrong angle can destroy the whole model. To make it as accurate and smooth as possible, I decided to hold the blocks together with PVA glue, so I can cut the entire house at once. However, dry glue can act as a barrier against the hot wire, so I had to cut it while the glue was still wet. The cut was measured by placing the building in the exact spot in the diorama and tracing the edge on the bottom with a pen. The first cut is rather simple, a few degrees here and there won't cause a disaster. However, the second one has to be perfect. So before I even started cutting, I measured, checked, rechecked and re-measured a few times using a right angle measure. And hey, it looks almost perfect. I mean, yeah, with a few imperfections here and there, but nothing that couldn't be fixed later. And check this one out. It fits flawlessly. This is awesome, my friends, because I think there's no point going forward if the very basics are messed up. It would just degrade the overall quality of our work. So now I could make the small outhouse using the same methods. First cutting its shape using my sketch, and then cutting the back wall flush with the diorama and the house. Ok, the worst part is behind us, fun times ahead. We won't need the diorama anymore and... You know what, let's change the background for something that's gonna be easier on the eyes. Ok, so getting the basic dimensions right was a huge success, but an equally important part is the texture, and that means scribing. Just a straight edge, a hobby blade and our sketch. I started by marking out the floors. I saw this detail in another photo and it's a good way to start our work. Bricks in 135th scale should be 2.5mm tall, 4mm wide and 8mm long. I like to add the extra half millimeter to their height. Getting the horizontal lines is the most important part and once you get that out of the way, the rest is very easy. In fact, it might be more efficient to make a simple paper template so you don't have to chase millimeters on a straight edge. Now comes the trickier part. Once I had the floors marked out, including the bricks, I could scribe the window openings. This would be much easier if the entire house was built from bricks, but I wanted to make its facade more interesting. It's gonna be a combination of geometric shapes built from bricks and the rest is gonna be filled with stones. This made scribing more time consuming and some thought and planning had to be done beforehand, but again, using millimeter paper for your sketch makes this task very quick and accurate. Overall, this is probably the only downside of scribing directly into the foam. Fixing mistakes is not easy, so everything should be pitch perfect on your first try. 
However, compared to gluing individual bricks one by one, the advantages greatly outweigh anything else. Scribing is faster, more accurate, more fun, and ultimately easier, except the measuring, yeah. But if these were the fun times after the hot wire cutting, even funnier times await us, because it's time for sculpting. I like to start by enlarging the horizontal lines first. This is where the extra half millimeter is important, because after this procedure, the actual height of each brick is gonna be around 2 millimeters. There are many tools suitable for this task. A razor blade, a box cutter, some kind of small spatula, or these plastic photo edge gizmos that come with master tools photo edge bending tool. For vertical lines, again, I'm sure everyone has or can find their favorite tool. For me, it's a small dentist spatula which I normally use to apply modeling putty. Things are starting to take shape at this point, but I like to go one step further and make the edges more round. I know, not totally realistic, but it makes the bricks more natural in a way, and it's gonna make them look even better once the mortar lines are applied. Now that we're done, we can take care of the windows. There's not gonna be any interior detail, but we'll make a nice optical illusion using glass and some paints. The foam can be easily torn out without damaging its surroundings. I usually like to cut a lot deeper around windows. This allows me to remove the foam safely and as deep as I want. I also scribe the brick lines a lot deeper here, so now I can simply enlarge them and it's all gonna look super realistic once windows are glued in place. Okay, let's now take care of those empty spots and make them look like stone. Masonry is much easier to sculpt because it's more random. However, it's good to have a reference picture in front of you because if something is random, it means it doesn't have to be geometrically perfect, which is awesome, right? But on the other hand, our brains like to create and follow patterns. So unless you're some stone whisperer, loosely following a reference picture is gonna lead to better results than coming up with the shape on your own. For texturing, I used a broken toothpick. The jagged wood is a pretty nice stamp, although in my stone wall video you advised me to use scrunched up aluminum foil. Well, a toothpick is more accurate in these tight places, but looking back I'll definitely try the foil, even on bricks, because as I found out it knocks down the foam's fuzzy texture. Sculpting was carried out completely with a dentist spatula. Another good thing about having a plan is saving time. For example, because I already know the layout of the entire house, I didn't have to waste energy texturing the part where the outhouse will be. Rocks are actually more interesting than bricks. Some of them have sharp, jagged edges, others are more rounded. So more variation equals more texture equals more awesomeness. Going back to bricks. They can be additionally textured by pressing some of them deeper. To make my life easier, I made a simple stamping tool from a piece of plastic. The square part is cut to the brick's dimensions and the handle is just a plastic rod. Pretty simple, yet it's gonna serve well in the long run. Going back to the importance of sketching, I just can't stress this enough. Um, if there's a nice detail we'd like to recreate, it's sometimes easier to draw it first and then replicate the shapes on our building. Honestly, I'm fairly new to this, so I keep discovering new tricks along the way, and by the point I was finishing the house, I was doing a few things differently. But okay, now we're done with scribing. It's out of the way. But we're not done with the styrofoam yet. There are a few raised features that can be added separately, such as this section of broken plaster wall or the bottom of the house. Foam can be easily cut into very thin sheets, and we can prepare various thicknesses for different details. These can be cut with a knife, just like paper, and if the foam is so thin you can see right through it, it's possible to trace stuff such as the broken plaster. After cutting out the basic shape, I added more jagged edges, giving it a more convincing result. 
However, the final look will be achieved in the next episode because a plaster wall requires a combination of painting and stippling with acrylic body. But this will suffice for now. Same thing with these concrete panels. Planning ahead meant I only had to scribe the bricks around the broken corner. No need to spend time on stuff that's not gonna be visible, right? Well, styrofoam is amazing, but some things are better replicated with wood. Balsa might not be the best material because of its sponge-like texture, but I like working with it because it's so easy to cut and sand. The flexible styrofoam will ensure a tight fit, but it's always better to hold everything tightly with glue. Diluted PVA is also essential as it will reduce the fuzzy texture and the wood won't absorb paint so easily. My planning ahead game wasn't the strongest on these windows and I had to pay the price by destroying a few meticulously sculpted bricks. But hey, we all make mistakes, right? This actually put me in a destructive mood and I wanted to cause more damage. Missing bricks are another way of adding more texture and character to buildings. Not all of them have to be missing though. With some careful pinching, we can make them look crumbled and cracked. I mean, urban decay, that's what I'm all about. You might have noticed these vertically placed bricks. It's a common thing I see quite often, and it was another nice opportunity to be creative and add some extra small details. But okay, now I'm totally done with the facade. So, just like with the wood, I sealed everything with diluted PVA glue. It's gonna make the foam stiffer, thus more resistant against any accidental damage, but it also reduces the fuzzy texture, and hopefully it'll protect it against enamel thinner. Although, yeah, I'm probably gonna paint and weather it completely with acrylics. So, most of the house is finished, and it looks super busy, doesn't it? <laughs> But we're about to make something even busier. Yep, that's right. Although I made my own 3D printed roof tiles for my German barn project, French houses usually have shingled roofs. At first I wanted to make those from thin cardboard, but then I thought, why not use styrofoam again? It's gonna be more consistent and thus satisfying. Making individual shingles is pretty time-consuming, but I think it's the best way to achieve authentic-looking results. And unlike cardboard, foam can be textured, so yeah, it's an awesome material. Okay, gluing them went exactly as you'd imagine, and just looking at the footage makes me tired, so let's do it like this. Sweet! If only I had a roof shingle typewriter in real life. The roof ridge can be made as well, although some brute force needs to be deployed. But I mean, talk about consistency. Just like with the facade, I sealed everything with diluted glue. And I don't know why, but this reminds me of cereal with milk. And when it was rock hard, the excess was cut off. Which is another advantage, other materials wouldn't be so easy to work with. Okay, we're almost at the end, so let's take care of some final details. The thinnest balsa sheets I could ever find are 1mm thick, but that's just too much for planks. So when it comes to these, I prefer veneer, which is half the thickness. The downside? It's made from very hard wood, so I guess it's made from hardwood, right? <laughs> It's so hard I had to make nail holes before attaching them to the model, otherwise the brute force would damage the house. Imagine that happening in real life, damaging your house with a hammer. Balsa is more forgiving, so I prefer it for everything where the thickness isn't an issue. With the outhouse finished, I can glue the two structures together, pushing them firmly against the table so the back wall is gonna be flush. Well, my friends, I guess it was a success, but let's not forget the remaining details. I didn't feel like making my own window frames from styrene or wood, so I simply made a few 3D designs and printed them on my Photon Mono SE. 
I think it was the best way, because printing allows you to go into extreme detail, such as 0.1mm tall raised features, or even smaller stuff. Something that simply wouldn't be possible to achieve with plastic sheets. The files are available on my Patreon, by the way. The door got warped as I was curing the resin, so I had to reinforce it with the same material I just criticized, so yeah, plastic did save the day at the end of the day. <laughs> Printing is more accurate than carving styrofoam, so not all windows fit in place perfectly. If the opening was too small, then it was easy, I just pushed the foam away. If it was too large, I added a foam sheet, as if the window was held in place with cement. Yeah, I'm sure gonna paint it like that. The last important feature was flashing on the roof. Lead foil would be a better material for it, but the foam is just so satisfying. And to make the miniature look clean and professional, I filled the back wall with acrylic wood putty. Smearing it with a spatula creates a fairly smooth surface, giving you less work with sanding. And this has to be done very carefully, because too much force can damage or distort the styrofoam, ultimately causing more harm than good and destroying your whole model. And it's advisable to do it outside, because there's a lot of dust. But I already gave up, so I'm just doing it indoors. Anyway, although it's far from perfectly smooth, I think it does the rest of the house justice, and it's gonna look very nice once placed in a diorama. So that's gonna be it for tonight, my friends. And the next episode will be about painting and weathering. At first I wanted to release it as a single, compact, very long episode, but I wouldn't be able to finish it in one week. And I know how some of you like the weekly uploads, so... Yeah, it's gonna be a compromise. Building the building in this video, painting and weathering the next week. So I hope you enjoyed this episode, maybe learned something new, and if you never tried something like this, just give it a shot, it's a lot of fun. Just find the densest XPS foam possible, it's sold in house construction supply shops, and then you'll be good to go. Unfortunately, foam cutter is a must with these large complex structures, but if it's something small and simple like a wall for example, I think you can get nice cuts with a hobby knife. So I hope you liked the result so far, at least enough to watch the next video, and yeah, thank you for watching, it means a lot to me. I also gotta shout out my amazing patrons who make this weekly show possible, and if you'd like to see the next episode right now, it's already on my Patreon page. I'm also working in advance and posting behind the scenes content, such as almost daily updates from my workbench, so you could see how the painted house looks, or how is the diorama coming so far. Or we can get in touch through DMs and comments. I'm also posting these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution, also real life references for dioramas and buildings, and 3D files for printing, including the doors and windows from this house, or the roof tiles from my previous barn project. So that's gonna be it for tonight, and until the next one stay safe, stay awesome, keep building models, don't just collect them, and remember, the best kit on the market is styrofoam. <laughs> yeah, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!